Hello everybody. Welcome uh, to this talk on uh, software security at a rather odd point in the day. Uh, usually when we talk about security, it's very difficult to get developers interested in it. It's very difficult to get uh, people who are very involved with uh, creating features and things like that interested in yet another effort that sort of slows them down from putting more features into production. And uh, this is a case that is not local to one or two places in the world. It seems to be a feature that is very universal and unites developers everywhere. Um, welcome to this talk on Scorecard, which is a tool that's built by the OpenSSF. Now, score, the idea of Scorecard is to provide developers a means and a tool that can help them proactively assess their code bases, um, check if there's any vulnerabilities that have creep, crept in uh, during the process of development, and create a sort of idea about how good or how bad a code base can be. It's not a reflection of development practices per se, but it's more about trying to inform a team about what discipline needs to be built in and baked in. Um, so usually uh, when there's um, you know security problems in any company, there's only one strategy, a retreat, retreat, just everybody vanishes, you know, people don't want to take responsibility and things like that. And so that is the reason uh, for which the open SSF as a larger body exists. And I thought I'll just take a couple of minutes to introduce the foundation itself uh, before getting into um, the tool that we'll be talking about. So the Open Source Security Foundation or Open SSF is a cross-industry collaboration and a neutral body that exists in order to bring together a lot of open source contributors and have them focus on security. Now, um, you can find more information at opensf.org or scan the QR and do your thing. Uh, the OpenSSF is a part of the Linux Foundation and it groups together a lot of the different what used to be somewhat scattered security initiatives under one umbrella and serve the larger community uh, with very targeted security initiatives and steward a lot of the best practices that are you know common for uh, engineering teams uh, to adopt. Now, here is what I imagine a security audit looks like. So at first there's uh, people who come in and look for um, things that are broken very specifically um, and then they'll uh, make sure that you know vulnerabilities are assessed and we saw some of that during uh, the talk before. Uh, they'll conduct a lot of the testing of using these vectors that they identified um, and then finally they'll um, engage in a lot of the scanning of code that is going to be deployed and things like that. And you know these are again just an illustration of a very broad set of security initiatives at the end of which developers are extremely frustrated. No, they're, they're left with very little morale oftentimes and they this stuff happens very close to a release and not at a point that is you know far ahead in time usually where developers can make informed decisions as they go along and things like that. And so that's the reason why the scorecard project was introduced and is quite popular to be honest. So scorecard helps check for vulnerabilities that affect code bases as part of the development process itself. So call it DevSecOps if you will, call it a security mindset if you will. Um, you can give it a fancy name, but the idea is the scorecard will exist alongside the repo itself and it will always assess the health of the repo as we go along. Um, you can check out the project website itself at scorecard.dev. Uh, the, the idea behind scorecard is to build better developer habits and build better security 
disciplines for developers um, and and you can adopt scorecard one test at a time um, quickly assess you know how healthy or not the project is and things like that instead of you know exclaiming towards the end there so before developing scorecard there wasn't necessarily a good baseline with which you could assess your repo and create an understand create a shared understanding amongst your team or your broader engineering org of okay these are how good or you know how not good uh, our repos are and the idea is you can apply scorecard no matter how big or small a repo is um, it's basically a series of automated checks and um, i'll show a demonstration very quickly but again what i want to reinforce is scorecard is basically a collection of let's say three broad themes so there's what constitutes security holistically um, how well you can assess the risk of a code base and are there other build processes and other things that are associated which also need to be assessed so there's i think 18 different checks that fall under uh, these two three broad categories and it provides a single score now what it results in is removal of a lot of the entropy that surrounds okay is this a good way to you know proceed with in terms of development practices and things like that so um, it will help identify any malicious maintainers who might be in an open source um, repo or who are part of um, even let's say a closed repo at times um, it will it will identify build system compromises um, dependencies and packages um, are often times a, a notorious candidate for being uh, flagged by the scorecard we've seen some great adoption um, some um, good contributors uh, like cisco is a big contributor and a consumer intel is a big contributor and consumer google is a big contributor and consumer uh, of scorecard and uh, they've all helped sort of refine what the project can be and where it should go um, and like i mentioned it's it's an aggregate of scores across uh, different things and that helps um, how how it you know, showcases a uh, uh, good uh, metric. Now, there's a couple of ways in which you can consume scorecard. There is uh, GitHub Actions that you can add to every repo. There's also a scorecard CLI. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's take a look at how these two um, actually work. Um, let's see. I'll switch modes. Uh, for a bit um, so scorecard is a can be like I said can be used as a CLI um, you can hit it against any github repo let's see if there's uh, any repos you like you can let me know I'm happy to uh, hit scorecard against so us is if there's anybody you don't like i'm happy to record uh, an assessment of their repo as well and uh, make it available publicly so this is the, li the you know the list of tests that actually run now this is uh, um, not necessarily in any particular order but these are all the different tests that actually go into um, what the final assessment will be and while yeah so while this runs i thought i'd uh, switch to slides but now uh, because this is finished running and there's nothing more joyous at a tech conference than looking at um, terminal output so this is an example of a particularly bad repo so the aggregate score here is you know quite low and so uh, you can see the kind of details that are um, given here so if the repo contains binary artifacts it will automatically be um, given a lower score um, if it implements branch protection for example you get a slightly higher score and in the case of this repo branch protection is not enabled um, if it follows um, CII best practices and it's a badge that you can get um, it obviously gets a better score um, if there's 
code reviews that are constantly being conducted and um, if those review if github can send those um, can send that information as part of the api then that obviously gets a better score and so like you can see there's there's a bunch of different things that you can um, look at and uh, score your repos against and it's it's nothing complicated it's fairly you know basic common sense sanity checks for what a repo should and should not do now um, i'll also demonstrate the github actions um, what we can do is pick any repo that you like and um, let's see uh, i'm going to pick on your project <laughs> Uh, I, I love the pipe CD community. They're doing uh, a wonderful job in terms of uh, uh, continuous delivery. And if you're already not checking out the pipe CD folks, um, you should. So let's see. I'll create a fork of this. And then what I'll do is add the GitHub actions to this. And let's just take a look at um, what happens. So the way you add GitHub actions is you go to the security tab. And then you go into code scanning, and uh, let's see. Let me first enable code scanning. Yes. There's probably other workflows that are a part of this, um, which, which weren't enabled before. And so now when you go to configure scanning tool, you can. Um, you can go to explore workflows and do, let's see, scorecard. And so it's available as a pre-built GitHub action that you can configure on the repo. So it will generate a YAML. Um, you can set your cron to run at whatever time. Um, for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to um, I'm just going to commit this basic stuff and it will complete the, complete the first scan in a bit and then give us notifications about the result of the scan. But you know, basically what I wanted to demonstrate is you have the ability to set up code scanning from right inside any repo that you own. And uh, what it will result in is uh, something that we'll take a look at in just a bit. Um, but if in the meantime you just want to set up like something locally or you know what we can take a look at uh, what a good scorecard assessment will be since we already saw a bad one. Um, so this is the scorecard repo itself. Um, so scorecard repo. And it will go through the same set of tests basically, but obviously because this is a um, this is a more homegrown repo, the, the scores are usually well above nine, which demonstrates all of the best practices that um, you you could, should, must um, sort of follow. Um, so this one is, uh, like I said, it's it's set up to, uh, it's gamed in favor of a good score. And so it's, again, it's a good demonstration of what a good repo looks like. So while this finishes running, we could, uh, Yeah, so now there are some alerts here under code scanning. So this will highlight all of the different sort of things that you probably should take care of. Um, now all of the different tests are grouped by you know, how 
critical any vulnerability can be. And so it's given a severity level. So there's, uh, there's critical, there's high, there's medium, and there's low um, stuff, depending on you know what kind of problems there are. So for example, one of the medium levels of errors is you, know, you have pin dependencies inside your um, repo, and it's probably a good idea to change one of them. So if you go into one of these, um, scorecard is capable of not just showing what the problem is, but also providing some uh, sense of what remediation can look like. So you can uh, read through this and check you know, what is the actual problem and how you can uh, get started on um, changing this. And so here, um, I think the application um, is using a dependency that's sort of hard-coded. And there's probably some way you can um, remediate that um, in certain ways. And um, let's check one of the higher things. And it looks like there's a lot of like permissions um, issues and branch protection is not enabled somewhere and things like that. So um, it's it will show you that you know if you enable branch protection, for example, um, your um, your score will automatically increase with this and things like that. So, um, like I said, it's a it's a very useful tool to have. Um, you can have um, the score displayed here um, as part of your repo as well. So the, uh, there's there's support for that, um, and so people can quickly take a look at how good your repo is. So if you take a look at the second test um, that I'm running, this one finished with a score of 9.3. Like I said, um, it's it sort of game to do better. And so the reason is it, it scores well on all of these different uh, tests. So there's you know sufficient branch protection. It runs CI tests. It, it makes use of all of the best practices and things like that. And um, code reviews are um, constantly happening. And there's a bunch of different organizations that are contributing to the repo, which sort of signifies better health in the open source world. And um, there's, there's different heuristics like this that uh, scorecards, a scorecard helps assess. And um, again, is the repo maintained or is it not? And things like that. So each of these contribute in some form or manner. And the aggregate score that you see is a weighted average depending on if the severity is high, uh, is critical, high, medium, or low. So um, each of these uh, scores are given um, different weights. And that's, uh, that's how things function. Uh, let's, um, Let's switch back to slides for a bit. Um, yep. So of the different things that uh, I demonstrated, um, let's quickly go through some of the, at least the more critical ones. So webhooks are one of the more critical assessments. Fortunately, we didn't see it show up on any of the um, examples that we saw. But what this basically does is determine whether there's a webhook de defined in the repo with a token, and um, is it able to authenticate the origin of any requests that are made. Um, if repos are flagged with this problem, then the idea is um, you know, secrets and others are configured appropriately, and the webhook is actually not making any malicious calls and things like that. Now, one of the things that we did notice was a dangerous workflow. Um, now, this is basically, again, a more heuristic as a, and a best practice as opposed to anything concrete technically. Um, so for example, if there's any GitHub context or secrets that are logged as part of GitHub Actions, then um, you know, the, the, if there's anything untrustworthy in any of the scripts that are being run, then um, this uh, flag goes up. Dependency updates uh, checks for stuff like depend a bot and pie up or renovate bot and things like that. And um, if the project uses it, it's a it's obviously 
um, scored better and things like that. Um, and like I mentioned um, in the demo, maintained is the check that happens to see if the repo is actually actively maintained. Um, signed releases get a better score as opposed to unsigned releases, um, which I think is you know fairly common sense. Um, again, any tokens that people are using, that is checked for um, a principle of least privilege and things like that. And so depending on how well the um, permissions are designed, uh, it gets a better score. Uh, the rest of the you know things are all quite straightforward. People have uh, seen these things in the past. Again, learn more about the project. Um, do follow them on socials. Um, check out the project, apply them to your repos, and give us any kind of feedback. Uh, the community is very happy and open to receiving any and all kinds of feedback in order to understand how this can be improved, what other heuristics they're missing, what can be included, and things like that. That's sort of the end of the presentation. Uh, my name is Ram. I work as a, a security evangelist with the OpenSSF. Um, so this is a, you can find me on socials as Ram Ayangar in most places. If there's anything, you know, don't feel shy to say hi. And uh, I'm happy to connect and discuss any uh, anything we can do to improve not just OpenSSF, but open source security in general. Thanks so much for staying uh, till the end of the talk. Yeah, um, so the first question was about background into OpenSSF itself. The Linux Foundation, as an organization, has a lot of projects, and each of these projects have different initiatives. And what happens is individually, a lot of these teams were working on different security initiatives, but then there was no central sort of space for these security initiatives themselves. So in, I forget which month, but in the year 2020, uh, as we were recovering from the pandemic, uh, the Linux Foundation decided to launch a new foundation within itself and wanted to group all of the security-related projects. Now, uh, for example, there's a very popular CNCF security project called SIGSTORE, used to be a part of the CNCF, but is now a part of the OpenSSF, and it's a graduate project of the OpenSSF. So the idea is to curate a community of security enthusiasts who can then help curate tools and projects and things like that and create working groups that can apply to a lot of the Linux Foundation projects as opposed to each of them doing their own thing with security and having smaller communities. So it's a more horizontal, broad-based security um, initiative from the LF. Uh, and it's been three, four years now. There's a, there's a significantly growing number of members who are part of this. I mean, every sort of company that I can think of is is a is an open SSF member and um, so you know the usual suspects across Google's and AWS and Amazon and Microsoft and um, you know just a big bunch of uh, the the Linux Foundation members are also independently open SSF members in addition to that there's a lot of these startups that are invested exclusively in the security and the supply chain security space, they're also starting to sign up. For example, there's a company called Kusari who are working on this project called Guac. Um, I don't know if you heard about it, but basically what it does is um, it will create a visual graph of all of the dependencies and components that are inside an application. So Guac stands for graph for understanding artifact composition. So, uh, but the idea is if your software is composed of, let's say, 45 different different pieces of software, um, then Guac is able to visually identify those and um, 
showcase a lot of other metadata and so there's there's a there's an open source team behind this and they have a commercial company as well and so a bunch of different companies invested in these areas are signing on and one of the more recent um, initiatives that the open ssf is involved in is also like ai security so um, there's a obviously a lot of you know conversations going on around ai and consequently a securing ai is like a big chunk of these conversations and um, the open ssf is invested in that as well uh, the other thing is there's uh, there's engagement that the open ssf does in terms of technology like this and also education and policy so there's a lot of free security courses that you can take that are offered by the lf um, slash open ssf um, so th there's also a lot of like edu outreach that we do to like colleges and universities and things like that promoting these four or five free courses that you can technically take in order to become a better security person and finally the last piece that they also tackle is security policy so a lot of independent parliamentary government institutions have a take on policy in terms of security privacy and all of these things and um, you know the open ssf is always engaging with these bigger units obviously a lot more in the us a lot less in this part of the world but there's you know some form of engagement that they are um, always pursuing so i know for a fact that um, they're doing a lot with the us government um, the eu parliament uh, has a lot of proceedings about technology and policy which the open ssf is a part of and um, you know hopefully it will come to this part of the world uh, sometime soon as well but uh, it, it's something that you know they're they're working on so that's the long story short of the open ssf um, you had a second question about um, I am not fully aware of what that metric is. Um, so the question is, is there an overlap between the configuration benchmarks of the CIS? I, I've heard CIS come up in one or two different conversations. Um, scorecard, I think, is inspired heavily by those CIS metrics in some form or manner. Um, but I think they don't include certain parts and i think there's there is an area of overlap but i think there are also like independent areas for both the both the different um, sources for numbers and things like that thanks yeah if nothing else i think uh, you know we should all give ourselves back some time um, once again thanks so much for uh, being present and participating if you do have any questions during the course of the conference feel free to grab me i'll probably be standing by the food counter somewhere thank you